HMS Queen Elizabeth is the largest warship ever built for the Royal Navy, by far. Stretching longer than the Houses of Parliament and standing taller than Nelson's Column, an aircraft carrier so immense that different sections have had to be constructed in different shipyards throughout Great Britain, and then transported by barge to Scotland for final assembly. It's taken 10,000 workers eight years to build Britain's first super carrier. Putting the great back into Great Britain, what a wonderful thing to be part of. But as this gargantuan carrier takes shape and prepares for sea, there is one vital missing ingredient. The ship is just a, a metal box, it's a waste of time, it's useless. It's only when you add in the human component, blood and flesh, does it become a warship. This is the extraordinary story of the men and women who must breathe life into HMS Queen Elizabeth. How will these naval pioneers transform her from floating building site to frontline ship of war? They'll be embarking on perilous make or break sea trials in which everything must be tested for the first time. From galleys to guns and from power plants to propellers. One thing is for certain, it won't be plain sailing. Fire, fire, fire. Float, float, float in eight rows. Casualty, casualty, casualty! Everything electrical, get all the electrical panels covered up. Hot try. Oh, it's all the rust. You don't know what's going to happen. There might be a flood or something. <laughs> and then we have to take off. It's all the excitement. <laughs> This is a lot of people's first time at sea, so not only mine, but we're all up for it. HMS Queen Elizabeth has already courted controversy, with questions raised over her expense and even her role in the modern world. But with exclusive access over two years, nothing is hidden from the camera as the ship and her sailors are pushed to breaking point. If anyone thinks it's easy, then they're, they're fooling themselves. This is tough stuff. This is the inside story of Britain's biggest warship. It's May the 24th, 2016. HMS Queen Elizabeth is still under construction in Rosyth Dockyard in Scotland. The shipbuilders are working round the clock to get this supercarrier ready for her critical sea trials in about nine months' time. But many of the sailors who will be crewing her have already arrived. And today, one more sailor will add to their growing numbers. But no ordinary sailor. Come on, Diego, sir! Approaching, sir! Forty-nine-year-old Jerry Kidd commanded Britain's last aircraft carriers, HMS Illustrious and Ark Royal. Right! Hold! But they were a third of the size of Queen Elizabeth, the ship that Captain Kidd will take to sea for the first time. Right, well, good morning, HMS Queen Elizabeth. I'm not sure, guys, there has been a peacetime Royal Naval crew with as much expectation and as much excitement that currently rests on our shoulders probably in the last couple of hundred years. The world at the moment is pretty frisky. There is lots and lots of turbulence, security threats everywhere. And so therefore it is our mission to get Queen Elizabeth in the front line as soon as we can. Thank you very much indeed. The ship, still in build, is mostly out of bounds to sailors, but every new arrival, including the captain, is given a short preliminary tour. It's starting to come together. You can start seeing the fabric of the ship now being finished off. But many of the new arrivals are baby sailors, fresh out of training. I've just formed my semicircle round here then, team. We've got a rare treat today. If you look up on the mast as you walk down, on the aftermast you have our medium range radar, which is turning and burning at the moment. Everybody happy? Goggles up then, team, goggles up. 
The whole thing's coming along now quite quickly, isn't it? Anyway, good, keep going, yeah. So just take a few minutes to just have a look at the size of your platform that you're going to spend most of your career on. Just have a look what you're going to be part of. What do you think? I don't really know what to think, to be honest. <laughs> It's huge, isn't it? Yeah, it's massive. You look like you're in shock. I am a bit. <laughs> I'm sorry for getting in your way now. This is not going to be a uh, bed of roses. It's an absolute certainty that things won't go as planned. If you were building a, a new car uh, or a new uh, a jet liner uh, or a new mobile phone, uh, you'd have hundreds of prototypes, each one getting better and better and better and better, until finally the product's uh, accepted. You go, that's one, it's now faultless, it works, and then you mass produce it and sell it to the customer. Ah, you don't do that with ships, it's just too expensive. So this ship is first of a kind, it's the prototype and the finished product, and the one that's going to go around the world for five decades, all at once. No pressure then. There's never any pressure then, maybe. <laughs> Just watch your footing as you're coming up the steps, team. It is a building site. There is loads of trip hazards. Right, welcome aboard HMS Queen Elizabeth. The biggest project the Navy has ever been involved in. The biggest ship the Navy has ever built. Queen Elizabeth is split into 17 decks, eight above the flight deck and nine below. She has five kilometers of passageways and 3,000 compartments. This is the operations room. Everything on this ship revolves around this room. Fully integrated command system into weapon systems and into air traffic control as well. This hangar should be able to hold 22 F-35 aircraft. Just dress in then, team. All the other cabins of Junior 8 are exactly the same. They have got eight beds in them, but they're only housed for six members. So you can flip one of the beds up as a sofa. Loads of room for stowage. It is a huge amount compared to any other ship within the fleet. Good days. But the sailors won't be moving into their cabins for some time, as she's still in the hands of the shipbuilders, the Aircraft Carrier Alliance. And the man in charge of delivering her, a civilian, not a sailor, is Marine Engineer John Pearson. To see her come together, I think it's pretty amazing. It's, it's, it's very difficult to get your head around how you're going to pull together 65,000 tonnes of steel and make something that is quite, uh, quite as impressive as this. What makes this carrier so different is not just the technology, but the way she'll be manned. An American carrier of a similar size needs 3,000 sailors. HMS Queen Elizabeth will need less than 700. Called Lean Manning, this is a revolutionary concept in the world of warships. Well, this is the ship control centre. It's a highly automated. The way we describe this is this controls everything from power to poo. And so all the ship's machinery from propulsion, ventilation, electrical distribution, steering is all controlled from here. In a normal cruising state, the machinery for the ship would be operated by just six guys. Six? Mm. Lean Manning is not just about efficiency, of course, but saving money as defence budgets continue to bite. One of the innovations we've got to keep the manpower costs down is the highly mechanised weapon handling system, a system very similar to an Amazon warehouse. Most of that ammunition is stored in magazines that are right down in the, in the bowels of the ship, and traditionally that would be manhandled uh, with trolleys from those magazines to the flight deck. On this ship, the ship's crew can press a button, select a weapon, and is automatically transported up from the deep magazine on lifts. So the whole operation is about 30 or 40 guys can do that, where an American carrier, to do the same operation, is about 10 times as many people. Really? Yes. 30 against 300, that's quite a comparison. It is, yeah. Right, down you come then, team, just muster around here. But lean manning on a supercarrier is still an untested concept. These young sailors will be the guinea pigs, not so much test pilots, but test sailors of a giant warship. So we've just come all the way from the aft end of the ship, all the way to the front end of the ship, right? So from the stumpy end, all the way to the pointy end, OK? It's that big, we've just come through three different time zones. Joke. But what is not a joke is finding your way round if you're a sailor with only occasional visiting rights. Steve Prest will be in charge of all the weapons on board. 
So you know your way around now? Yeah, pretty much. I'm getting there. It's a big ship to learn. And it's also, it's also um, a bit like Hogwarts, because as things get built and as work's done on board, um, the routes you can take keep changing. So it's almost like the staircases keep moving all the time. That makes the challenge that much harder. Uh, I'll go up one more. But it's great fun. I still get boyishly excited every time I come on board. For the Navy, the ship remains a bit of a mystery. Can we get through to five uniform this way? Wait. I'm lost. It's blocked off. See, I told you, it's like Harry Potter, it's like Hogwarts. Can't go that way today. We'll go around this way. Most of the time, the sailors are not on the ship at all, but living here in temporary container homes just outside the dockyard. And they report for work every day to this nondescript office on the quayside where they just pretend they're afloat. From lowliest rating to the captain, Jerry Kidd. The whole ship's company are in here at the moment. The Ostwatch and the bridgemanship and the air engineering here, uh, the navigation section uh, here. Essentially, they're all in the little areas of speciality forming relationships, getting to know each other. Hello, the weapons group. I think you need a GPR off the back island. Mark Deller will be in charge of all aviation on the supercarrier. Right now, though, he and his team of deck handlers, essentially the ground crew, must work out how to manoeuvre aircraft on a tabletop version of his four-acre flight deck. Uh, well, this is the this is the high the high tech scenario for essentially developing our deck operations. It's got a few cutouts of the jets and a few men stolen from some, one of uh, one of my deck operations officers' kiddies toy box. So we now have our Manning as well. Right, so next one comes on this spot here. Yeah. 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 The deck handlers and firefighting teams are already working out how they're going to cope with up to 40 aircraft. He's not going to be ready before that second man. How they'll bring fully fueled jets up from the hangar, load them with bombs and missiles, and line them up for launching one after the other. Next one. Next one out. If you could turn on the sixpence, you can still see them. Do you get what I mean? And over, straight over. There are a number of issues that are coming out all the time. The fact is, everyone's just making do until they can get on board. Down the inside track. At the moment. This is a stone frigate, and this is why we're so keen to get on board. Yeah. Only then can you really start getting a, a bond with a ship, is when you move on board, live on board, eat on board. The primary aim now, for me, is just to get, let's just get on board, because that's when you get that emotional bond. That bond is essential for these sailors who will have to learn their brand new ship from scratch. So it's down at you, and obviously Paddy, to make sure that you're in position. So Big no Bruce no Milne, yeah, who will be responsible for the engines on board, is helping prepare these sailors to handle the most modern warship in the world. And he's doing it his way. Left! Launch! This is a Victorian field gun, first used by the Navy in the Boer War over 100 years ago. And racing them is a long Navy tradition. Jack! The relevance of field gun is it's all about teamwork. On a modern warship, nothing happens unless we work as a team. If the teamwork fails, the ship doesn't work. The team is training to compete in the Naval Field Gun Championships, a contest of skill, strength and courage. One wrong move and it's broken bones or worse. Run over 170 yards, teams have to dismantle and reassemble a tonne and a half of field gun at speed. Strict rules of procedure carry costly time penalties. It's not always the fastest who wins. It's coming, Fraddle. We can do this out back and home. Easy. Be the best you can. You can do it. Show everybody else you can do it. Happy? One One up. Up. Cracking. Well, sailors are not on board yet, and there might be still nine months to sea trials, 
but stores are already being loaded. This is just the beginning. <laughs> there are thousands and thousands of items to go on board that ship. This is just the beginning. And then what are you doing here? Fiona Percival, originally from Zimbabwe and in the Navy for 25 years, is the most senior female officer on Queen Elizabeth. She's in charge of supplies, everything from baked beans to bullets. In that corner there, there are the medical supplies. And over here now, this is all part of the uh, firefighting and damage control equipment. And everything we put on board has to be weighed because the naval architect needs to know how much weight is coming on board to understand where the weight is distributed in order to understand how the ship can manoeuvre and handle. It's amazing how much stuff you need. You don't want to be going to sea and then find You've you... have forgotten something. You left the bottle opener at home. <laughs> <laughs> we better not have left the bottle opener at home. <laughs> you have to have a shot of the toilet rolls. That is the most important commodity we have on board. Everything else can run out, but not the toilet rolls. Not only is the ship being stored up, she's being powered up as well. There are six engines, two gas turbines, and four diesels. We've got 110 megawatts of electrical generating capacity. Um, and to give you a sense of scale or context, 110 megawatts is about what a town the size of Swindon, or up here in Scotland, a town the size of Aberdeen, um, would typically consume. So, you know, we're effectively a, a power station for a for a medium-sized medium -sized town. Big Bruce Milne, taking time off from revving up his field gunners, is about to rev up the main diesel engine for the first time. What we're doing now, we turn the engine, pushing air onto the pistons, um, just to prove it works. This is all part of the pre-start check. Good to go for the uh, main engine. So, I think good naval tradition, have the warm stand clear of intakes and exhaust. About to start HMS Queen Elizabeth's main engine. Press the button. Right. Oh, diesel's just starting up. That in itself is quite exciting, just to, you know, and you can almost feel the vibration through the deck. That'll be the heartbeat of the ship for the next 50 years. On conventional warships, engines drive the propeller shafts directly. But on here, the engines generate power for the ship as a whole, and what's needed for propulsion is siphoned off by high voltage, or HV cables, carrying 11,000 volts. But this is a brand new hazard in the event of flood or fire. We've got the HV compartments, and if you start throwing water around in there, potentially 11,000 volts, there's not going to be a lot of you left if you get electrocuted. So people have to change their mindset, especially the older sailors of us that come from traditional ships, that you haven't had an HV element. But you've got to have an awareness. You can't just come in here and be blasé about it, because it will kill you. So, danger in the belly of the ship, but potentially even greater risk on the flight deck. In many ways, the Achilles heel of any aircraft carrier. Whoa! <laughs> a floating airfield for warplanes loaded with fuel, bombs and missiles. The risks are enormous. Computer simulation helps the aircrew plan for the worst. Launch the jet. Whoa! <laughs> Maritime aviation at its best. <laughs> Operating at sea is not rocket science, but operating at sea is bloody dangerous. You know, there's a whole load of people who have gone before us who have learnt the hard way as to why you do certain things. I'd be a bloody fool to ignore what our forefathers did. That's nice. There you go. Look at that. We've solved the problem. It's probably worth just explaining about an airfield. An airfield has a 10,000 foot runway. OK, and we know what's going to happen on the runway. That's where the jets are going to be taking off and landing. So at the same time on that airfield, you're going to have to have a bomb dump. You're going to have to have a fuel dump. You're going to have to somewhere where you're going to house everyone. And there'll be an HQ section. But all of those in a 2,000 acre estate are spread out. You keep the bombs away from the runway. You keep the fuel away from the runway. You keep the fuel away from the accommodation. 
our ship, which although the biggest thing the Navy's ever built, compared to this 10,000 foot runway, our ship is there. We've got a metal box. In there, there'll be a magazine. There'll be the fuel. And if you think of the flight deck area and all the armed aircraft up there that are both operating, rearming, refueling, there's a lot of potential risks that we have to manage. In 1967, on the USS Forrestal, an electrical fault led to the discharge of a missile on deck, setting off a train of events that killed 134 sailors and injured many more. In that scenario, it was all about time. It was all about how quickly could they contain it. These are aircraft handlers that are now moving in to try and rescue the aircrew. What started as a single incident suddenly became a cumulative incident and rocket into an armed aircraft, then became a fire, then became a fuel fire, then created the heat to cook off the live ordnance that was sitting on those armed aircraft that then created a greater explosion, which then meant more aircraft impacted. They almost lost the ship. They did control it in the end, but they lost a hell of a lot of lives. Handling aircraft on the deck of a carrier requires great skill and courage. One mistake could lead to the loss of not just an aircraft, but the whole ship and everyone on it. That'll be no less true of the Queen Elizabeth as it was of the Forrestal. That's why deck handlers need constant practice. Bringing aircraft in, seeing them off, and then parking them on an ever-crowded flight deck. But at least by June 2016, the Queen Elizabeth handlers have graduated from tabletop training to something more akin to the real thing. This dummy deck in Cornwall is still only a third the size of their own, and the old decommissioned Harriers might not be able to fly, but at least things are moving forward. There will be things we're getting wrong, but they're ultimately, um, this, is, this is our practice. What well, we do it on the deck for real, with the ship manoeuvring, with a bit more sort of operational pressure, we can't afford to get it wrong. So we'll get all our mistakes out of the way here, and then when the real jets turn up, we'll be in a better place. The real jets will be top secret F-35B Lightning Stealth Fighters. These are still in development and kept strictly under wraps, so none of the deck handlers have ever seen one let alone handled one. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to give you a little dip on the uh, fixed wing replica of an F-35B. Life size to scale. Right, so, if we go so not an we actual F-35, but a life-size fiberglass model. Eventually, their job will be to manoeuvre these around the deck and guide the pilots into position. This will give them a feel for the real thing. Compared to a Harrier, didn't realise how big it was. Yeah. 29-year-old Emma Ranson from Liverpool, newly promoted to petty officer, will be the first flight deck leader on Queen Elizabeth. So this outsized airfix kit is a glimpse into her own future. Amazing. I mean, what can you say about it? Just amazing. It's just going to help our training out loads. It's just going to really benefit us as aircraft handlers, moving this around the deck. Just unbelievable. I'm dead excited now. I can't wait just to get it moving. So Emma, with her new toy, now has a much more realistic way of training her team. But for Big Bruce's field gun team, training is over. It's their day of judgment, as they psych up for the heats of the field gun championships. It's down to the guys now, you know, to put together all they've learned over the last six weeks do the best and then hopefully get position in the final. And it's highly competitive. Oh, most definitely, you know, it, there's no friends in this game. The friends happen after the final run and the beers start flowing. <laughs> um, so at the moment, it's uh, everybody's an enemy. HMS Queen Elizabeth, by the centre, quick, on! Today at HMS Collingwood in Hampshire, the field gunners are running for the pride of their ship. But tomorrow, they could be running to save their ship. Just like Emma and her team of deck handlers, who must be ready to react if things go wrong, like a crash on deck. As soon as a fire happens, I'm in overall command of the actual firefighting teams and the rescue. So as soon as a fire happens, I'm pretty much the uh, lead role on that. This will be the first time Emma's led her team as firefighters. 
a big day for the young petty officer. Emma, you asked to be on Kiwi, didn't you? How come? Well, we've never had a ship like this, and I'm never going to do this again in my career. So it's just to be part of something bigger and better for the Navy. It's the future. So it's good to be part of it. And I can hopefully, when I have children, then I can talk to him and say, oh, mummy was part of that, so it's quite a proud feeling. Love it. <laughs> the fleet's standard time to put out a fire on a warship is 75 to 90 seconds. A winning run in the field gun, 75 to 90 seconds. But remember, mistakes in drill can mean costly time penalties. Clean runs for Big Bruce's team. No time penalties. Best run, 82 seconds. Heads up, come on, Big Bruce. And a place in Big the Bruce. finals. Emma and her team put out the fire in 95 seconds, just short of the target. So how did it go? Uh, I think it wasn't too bad, sir. We had a few little problems up on that hose, but easily rectified. And... Then you were using your best soft, genteel tones, weren't you, to try and cajole this end. You're going to have to sort of toughen up your vocal cords. And hand signals? Hand signals seem to work a lot better when we are operating it nose to tail. As soon as we say that to a naval airman, they automatically know what you want. For Emma, the day is done, but not for the field gunners. It's the field gun finals, and the competition is fierce. We're nearly at the end. Let's go out with a blaze of glory. Yep, yeah, you've worked hard six weeks. you put it all together, you've done everything we've asked you to do. Now it's the time to prove it to everybody else out there how good you are. Two! HMS Queen Elizabeth! You know, the ship is just a, a metal box. It's a waste of time. It's useless. It's only when you add in the human component of blood and flesh, the emotions and the training, does it become a warship. Otherwise, it's just an anodyne robot. So getting the ship's company to fuse with the ship emotionally, but also in terms of how to operate it and the routines, absolutely fundamental. <laughs> But who's got the most time penalties? This is why we do not know where anyone stands within the competition. It's all very, very close. The crew gave it everything they've got. And it's got to the point now that we're just waiting on coming from the judges' tent, seeing whether there's been any penalties applied for the crew. Nerve-wracking at the moment. You know, it's our cup final. You know, we want to win. OK, settle down. It gives me great pleasure to tell you that you won. Yeah! Yeah! Well done, well done. Well done. Well done. Hey, come on, well done. Well done. Yeah, well done, well done. Well done. Well done, well done. Well done mate. Well done. We knew we were good, we were just proving it, and like I say, it's emotional with everybody now, you know. Capital ship, future fleet flagship, there's no limit now. If you can harness this crew atmosphere you've got within 18, you bring it to a ship's company of 685, going up to 1200 with air crew on board, we're well beater. It's simple as that, well beater. A world beater, maybe, but over the next few months, the focus is all about proving the ship's safety. Emergency escape routes must be put to the test. Quick access to clean air is essential in the event of fire and smoke. 
especially from the deep lower decks. You can ship mid, sense of urgency, my son. The ship's flood and fire sensors have to be checked and all 14,000 sprinklers individually tested. He's seen the carbuncle and he's pricked it. Bob Hawkins, at 55, is the oldest sailor on board. Formerly a naval diver and bomb disposal expert, he's overseeing the ship's ultimate safety system. Roger, stand by all positions, operating MIS-6. But it's one that everyone prays will never have to be used. Extraordinarily important event today. The first time that the ultimate rescue system, should the ship be sinking after action damage, uh, and God forbid that the order is given to abandon ship. It is this marine evacuation system that's going to see our sailors safely down the chutes into the life raft. Operate the mares! It's essential that this mass evacuation system is proven beyond doubt before Queen Elizabeth can set sail. That was quick. Look how quick it goes. Yeah. Yeah. There are three emergency chutes on either side of the ship. Each one can be fully deployed in 60 seconds. Every life raft can take 100 sailors. Extraordinarily happy, yes. I mean, uh, one of the first active things that this ship has done. By October 2016, although not on board yet, everyone's in optimistic mood. <laughs> the sea trials to test the ship in open water are set for March 2017, in only four months' time. But just getting the ship to sea isn't going to be straightforward. For one thing, she's at least 10 metres taller than the bridges she'll have to sail under. If you can see on the aft island, there's, there's a tall, thin mast, uh, which is, is the pole mast. And that's the highest point on the ship. And if you look closely at its base, you'll see two small, shiny cylinders. That's actually the hinge. It's, it's on a hydraulic system, and it folds forward and sits in a little cradle. Um, and that'll give us the clearance to get out under those bridges. And even then, the clearance is going to be pretty tight. There's not a lot of space. <laughs> Because we won't know until we get around, that's the thing. Captain Jerry Kidd wants to see for himself. So the masts were going straight under these, straight under that blue thing there. Uh, we'll put the wheel on now, so here's one continuous slow turn. It's a bit like when you drive your car into a car park with that bar. It is, it is exactly the same feeling in a ship, because the you, sw you look at the bridge, you think to yourself, we're, we're going to hit the bridge. It just looks really odd. And of course, everyone crouches as you go underneath. Uh, you've done the calculations, you absolutely know. But you know what, as you approach it, you, there's, you just can't help but think to yourself, <laughs> you know, so, uh, I, hope, I hope we're right. Well, our wind limits are going to be on it's just 15 knots, so, so wind's going to be the dominating factor. And it's not just about the bridges. He'll first have to squeeze his very large ship through a very tiny sea gate. As you can see, the ship is just ahead of us now, sitting on uh, K JK berth here in the main basin. And what we'll do is we'll come off uh, under with tug assistance, obviously, through the direct entrance, which is this dock wall you see right in front of you, which the van is going over right now. So this is it. This is where we're going to come through. So in terms of gap between the dock well, the side. Idea, I think there will be a slight gap of about a metre. A metre, it's a half a metre either side. Yeah, yeah. And it's extraordinarily narrow for us. Of course, we won't know until we get around, yeah, that's uh, the thing. HMS Queen Elizabeth Ships Company! Ha! It's December 2016, and sea trials draw near. Okay. HMS Queen Elizabeth Ships Company, muster for your clear lower deck, sir. Thanks, number one. The target date for departure, March the 10th, is in less than two months. Everyone's looking forward to the big day. It's been a long time coming. But just before Christmas leave, the captain calls everyone on board. 2017 for us guys is all about getting the ship to sea and offshore. But I did think it was important for me to stand up here in front of you all 
look at you all in the faces and in the eyes and tell you right now, we're not going to be sailing on the 10th of March. I can fully understand the frustration. Trust me, it's frustrating for me too. The last thing as a sea captain I want to be doing is sitting in recital alongside the wall. I don't know when we're going to go. The ship has got a whole bunch of new systems, both to detect fire and smoke, uh, but then also to smash a fire down. At the moment, we're not as mature in some areas as we would wish. You know, I've, I look at my young sailors, some of whom are 17, 18 years old, and I've got a 17-year-old son, and my benchmark, my litmus for me, as the captain of the ship is, uh, would I put my 17-year-old son uh, in that bunk space, or would I put him in that situation? Um, if the answer's no, then I'm not certainly going to do it with my ship's company. Christmas, guys. Enjoy it. I'll see you again in the new year. Uh, so be ready to come back. Next year, we do indeed make history. Don't forget that. So have you worked out where you're going to put the boards, get some of that bubble wrap? It's the first day back after Christmas. No date yet for sea trials, but one thing has changed. The sailors are told to bypass their old office block and report to the ship. They won't be sleeping on board yet, but from now on, this is where they'll be working every day. The shore, on board. <laughs> this tin box is a little piece of Britain and we will be living inside it. She will become our home. This is a big deal. And today marks a really, really important step forward. When we start working on board this ship, moving out of that god-awful office complex and actually start operating like a proper ship's company on a properly constituted Royal Navy warship. I mean, today is a great day. At some stage, no matter what the spreadsheet tells you to do, you've got to move on board, you've got to get on board. And, uh, and so today was a day that was chosen, today is a day we get on board, sort of making it feel like your own. I mean, the number of people I've also seen picking up litter, because now it's their ship. Swear box. Newly arrived Dave Garrity is the executive warrant officer, responsible for welfare, morale and discipline. And he's a car boot sale fanatic. Hi, hi. <laughs> Are you bothered? No, not really. It's the pinnacle of my career and it's not just a cheesy throwaway line, I actually mean this, it is absolutely brilliant. I feel like an 18 year old again on my first shift and hopefully that will come across when I meet the sailors because you'll have tough days in here and we just walk up onto the, onto the flight deck and look and just go, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, we're the first people on board this ship, breathing life and, and setting sail. Hot tray. And now that everybody's working on board, they will also have to be fed on board. Today is so exciting because it's our first time that we've actually got in here. It's the first time you can see chefs getting to grips with their galley and trying to understand how does it work. You know, have we got the counters in the right order? Have we got the flow through the dining hall? To actually get this thing operational and get it starting to feel and smell, <laughs> to smell like an operational ship is what this is about. Everybody starts to get to grips with their own parts of ship. And the air wing claim their flight deck at last. First thing they do, check for litter. One of my main tasks is obviously to fly safely. And um, one of the major constraints to flying safely is foreign object debris. This, is, this can be anything. It can be that plastic bag just flying around on the deck. It could be a, a sailor's hammer. It could be a coffee cup. Anything that can be ingested by an aircraft and essentially stop the turbines working, jam up the propellers, and it's not good for it or indeed cause a fatal catastrophic crash. So the Foreign Object Debris Walk, or FOD plod, is the single most important activity on any aircraft carrier. All right, guys, stay there. Every time we go to flying stations, we conduct FOD plod. We do it as we start day flying, we do it every six hours, and then we do it before we start night flying. So it's, a, it's an ongoing, continual process, a little bit like painting the fourth road bridge, you know. It's now May 2017. The ship's had a lick of grey paint and is looking the part. Nobody's living on board yet, and there's still no firm date for sea trials, but Queen Elizabeth is about to get the one thing she needs to move forward. 
literally. Ten shiny new solid bronze propeller blades. Five each for the two propellers. Hi guys. Hello. I'm the captain of the ship. I thought I'd come and say, uh, say hello and say thanks very much for what you're doing. Yeah, They're a sort of a work of art, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. They're beautiful. Well, when you see a sail, I'll think of you two. Thank you very much, sir. There we go. <laughs> there we go, you see. So nice and clean. We like clean propellers because clean propellers mean more power, more speed. So thanks, guys. Good to see you. You know, nearly uh, well over 100,000 horsepower are going to be transmitted through these blades once they're on. You know, that's like, it's like putting the wheels in the car. You know, da -da, we're done. So uh, very exciting. The diving teams have fit these blades, the propellers, uh, underneath the water, obviously. Um, so a really hard job. In the water. Up to now, they've had to test the engines and drive shafts without propellers for fear of forward movement. This is an absolute indicator of our progress and the fact that we, 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 we're, we're near, we're getting there. We've had a few full storms. It's uh, 16 months now that I've been on board the ship and it is realistic that we're going to go at the end of June. The Aircraft Carrier Alliance would not be putting the blades on now if we weren't near to ready to go. So we're talking now in degrees of weeks and days of a delay, not months. Right, go back to the blade, to top of the blade again, Tyler. There we go. Right. The blades are guided into position, secured by a total of 160 bolts. You're just giving these a quarter turn, aren't you, Gav? It's precision work in the murkiest of waters. When completed, each propeller will weigh 33 tonnes and combined will generate the same power as 50 high-speed trains. So there's progress below the water, but also above. The ship's company is finally given the go-ahead to move on board, full time. It's now June the 1st and the sailors are given the keys to the ship, all 10,000 of them. We're moving forward. <laughs> Come on, Ed. Back this way. Lights. Lights work. This is good. There we go. Important things in every head of department's cabin. Home from home. <sighs> this is so wide. Over the next two weeks, everyone starts to settle into their new home. I'm about to come up here again. That's superb, that. <laughs> it's a better office than what I work in. God alive. Things are suddenly moving very fast. By June the 7th, it's confirmed the ship could go to sea as early as the next spring tide. That's in less than three weeks. But first, the crew must prove they're ready in a gruelling, even dangerous ordeal. Tomorrow, all shore power will be turned off. We're going to blow the engine over. We're not going to start it. We're just going to blow it over. The carrier will be totally dependent on her own engines for the first time. Nobody will be allowed off the ship for six days, whatever happens. We've got pre lube on. For they're about to embark on an arduous sea journey without moving an inch. The Navy call this a test cruise, and it's not for the faint-hearted. We know it's not going to be a beautiful thing next week. Uh, it's not going to be the sort of test crews, training crews that we're all used to in the Navy because we are immersed in a, still a build. It's still a, a building site in many areas. And we've got a lot of young people here now, as you know, another batch joined today, uh, who are some, some of them are quite nervous about what's coming up. As the sands of time run out, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse for us before it gets better. As soon as we get offshore, we can settle down and get into a proper battle rhythm. And don't, don't lose your rag with people who perhaps are very inexperienced. OK, Darren, you got anything else to, to sum up? The test cruise starts. A journey into the unknown in which anything could happen. For exercise, for exercise, for exercise. Fire, fire, fire. Tap one, Alarms trigger a relentless stream of punishing exercises, day and night. Nobody knows when or where the next one will be, but reaction must be immediate. Flash, fire doors released. 
to zone three. Flood and fire situations are simulated, but made as realistic as possible. This is all about honing skills, working as teams, and vitally, speed of reaction. Because on this untested ship, there's no guarantee the next alarm won't be for real. We've got 3,300 compartments on board the ship, spread over many decks, so it is, it is a challenge to find your way to the incident quickly. But that's what we're training for today, to get to know the ship and how it operates. Lads, the sensor went off in six decks. Every scenario is carefully monitored, timed and assessed. If the sailors fail to impress, Jerry Kidd will be forced to delay the ship's departure yet again. The temperature of the compartment without going in is a steady 27 degrees. But then halfway through the week, there's a very different sort of problem. High winds have stopped the cranes from slinging on the food needed for sea trials. There's only one thing for it. Call a temporary stop to the test crews. Can you hear that, first time speaking? We are in a warship, but we've got a store ship. Clear lower deck of all junior eights, muster in the hangar to store ship. Just listen to the people, and we'll get this done as quick as possible, all right? Listen to it! Awesome. Right, let's go. We shouldn't be doing this. It should all be being slung on. But the wind is too high for the slinging. So unfortunately, with all the technology inboard the ship, it's outboard the ship that has stopped us. So now we have to do it by hand. It's good old tradition. Bonds the ship's company. <laughs> what makes a ship come live are the people that serve in that ship. And uh, we're seeing that. We've only been on board now for uh, just over a week, and it's amazing how we've gelled, how we're stamping our personality on this ship. With all the food on board, it's straight back to the test crews. For your purposes, the aircraft will be the tractor, and he will stop round about 500. Happy? Matt's getting the smoke and flame. For Emma Ranson, it's crunch time. Her team's speed of reaction to a fire on deck is about to be tested. As before, 90 seconds is her target time. OK, are we all ready in all respects? Roger that. OK, the aircraft is on its side and the aircraft is now on fire. Guys, come back, come back. If the ship does go to sea, it'll only be days before the first helicopter lands on. And a flight deck fire might be for real. Guys, come back! Cashfile Rescue is in attendance in the zone. The incident is being quashed. 30 seconds to get to the conflagration, 60 seconds to extinguish. Target achieved. Putting the cadence on the forward lift. Down to the hangar. Down to the across hangar. to the medical lift. On an interita. That's all done. How did it go? Uh, quite a lot of bombardment. So there was a lot of questions getting asked. Um, on myself because how we've been running it has been a lot of a slower pace and this was the first proper everyone in attendance. I found as an incident leader a lot of information is coming my way all at once and I was quite a person in demand so that was a bit of a culture shock. <laughs> that was a good little run out and it worked quite well. So we're pleased. That's a happy, a happy face. Well, this is one of many such... <laughs>
ceased throughout the ship until the standing sea right, emergency ground have dealt with the whoa, 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 whoa. This is for real. There's a flood in an engine room. In fact, one of Big Bruce Milne's diesels. It's high voltage. This could not be more dangerous. Everything electrical, all the electrical boxes covered up. Get all the electrical panels covered up. Classic shooting! Any mistakes, any oversights could be disastrous. If 11,000 volts of electricity arc now, everybody here is dead. A high level cooling pipe has ruptured and seawater has been damming up behind lagging. The lagging on the whole of the deck head has just acted as a barrier, so the whole of the lagging is now top of the lagging. It's that dammed up water that is now bursting out, but onto high voltage equipment. The high voltage circuits have been switched off. All electrical panels have been covered. But flood sensors in HV compartments immediately below have now been triggered. HV safe by golf. The response was immediate, so flood stemmed and emergency contained. But it could so easily have turned to disaster. We were worried that if the water started pouring through again, we could have ended up with it arcing and an electrocution. So we've got to be mindful of this, so that everybody that attends these scenes of any incidents know the dangers inherent with the compartment. This is when you find out who's going to lose the head and who's going to look at it in a pragmatic way and think, well, actually, yeah, this is how we're going to start and this is what we're going to do next and, and I require this man manpower. So it all comes down to a thinking man's game, you know. The test cruise has been a wake-up call for everyone. A stark reminder that an untested warship is an inherently dangerous place to be. I mean, we would normally do training in six weeks. We're pretty much doing it in six days at the moment. Very compressed, um, but we've gone from, from being a real sort of clunky organisation on the ship to working as a team, uh, looking out for each other uh, and safely delivering what the captain wanted for us to safely proceed to sea and deal with any incident that may occur. Well, the weather's nice now. It's Thursday, June the 22nd, and the captain has once again summoned his ship's company. Ship's company, standards east! Right. We've just taken the decision that we will go for sailing on Monday. It is not lost, I hope, on any of you how momentous this could be and what this means for the Royal Navy. For those of you who have not been to sea before, I want you to remember there is no cavalry or fire brigade when we move off the wall. We will have emergencies. We will have floods, and aren't we well practiced of those already? And we will probably have fires. We will probably have casualties. That is the nature of this business. This is our ship now. Don't forget it. It's Monday, June the 26th, 2017. And after 20 years of technical and scientific development, eight years of engineering and construction, and two years to assemble and train the ship's company, HMS Queen Elizabeth prepares to go to sea for the first time. The tide is high, the winds are light, and the ocean beckons. Nice quiet, Tony. All ready, Captain? 
We're good, we're safe, the pilots are here, the tugs are here. Ship's company are clearly up for it. Um, this is the combination of years of work from everyone, particularly the last six months, and we just need to get out now. There's a quarter of the ship's company we've never been to sea before. Uh, what, what, a, what a vessel to get, get to sea on, absolutely fantastic. Lines going now. Get there. All parts of ship. This is the boats on the bridge. Let go. All lines. Three. Here's going. Now going now. Nice fishing. We're now no longer attached to Scotland. HMS Queen Elizabeth is coaxed off the wall by a fleet of tugs. This is what's called a cold move. The supercarrier is not yet under her own power. We're doing what we should be doing now. You know, we're no longer a building site, we're a ship. Next, there's just the matter of squeezing through that basin gate. It is remarkable. We've got 30 centimetres either side of the entrance. It's very tight, but after careful manoeuvring by expert tugmasters, HMS Queen Elizabeth slides safely into the Firth of Forth. On board, 700 sailors and 200 construction workers, all preparing for the rigors of sea trials. It's not until midnight, when the tide is low enough to get under the bridges, that the cold move becomes a hot one, and the ship's brand new propellers start to spin for the first time. First time we sail the supercarrier out, and uh, this is the last part under the bridges and uh, at night, at low water, uh, with a brand new uh, crew. The ship's performing really well. She's not vibrating, she's turning on a sixpence. Uh, very early signs are very, very positive indeed. Two cables to run. Two cables to run, Roger. Finally, with the tide at its lowest and the pole mast down, the supercarrier edges under the fourth rail bridge with just a few metres to spare. OK, here we go. Happy? Looks good to me. Straight through the middle. And now the way is open. But what next for the ship's company? They were pushed to their limits on a one-week test cruise without even moving. How are they going to handle six weeks on the high seas at full speed? Their adventure is about to start. Next time, Queen Elizabeth flexes her muscles and bares her teeth. My well, guys, let's do it. Well done. Be safe. There's a first flight deck landing, but then the engineers hear troubling noises from under the ship, and it's not good news. Have the recruits got what it takes? Secret agent selection continues, this time tomorrow here on BBC Two. We're deep in the heart of the Indonesian rainforest in search of an ancient civilization. My year with the tribe follows in just a moment. <laughs>